first of all, I want to thank Burlington Central High School for hosting me this morning. We are here in their veterinary veterinary lab, and um, it's it's amazing um, to see what this space has to offer and to know what students are doing in this space. They had students who recently won a national competition here from District 301, and it is a super cool space that has um, dozens and dozens of students in their VET 1 and VET 2 program, as well as other students in their ag programs. And um, this is kind of a big part of, of kind of what we want to anchor in on, actually, as we think about this work. And so to, to get us going, um, I want to start by introducing myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jason Klein. I'm the Senior Director of Learning Partnerships at Northern Illinois University. I work as part of the leadership team alongside Rodrigo Lopez, our Director of P20 Initiatives, and the Dean of our College of Education, Dr. Lori Ellis Piper, with the Illinois P20 Network. And I also work as part of the NIU Illinois CTE Project team that works alongside ISBE on all things uh, career and college readiness related, as well as career and technical education related. And so um, with that, the, as we'll talk about in a moment, the PACE framework is, is central to that. If you're unfamiliar with the Illinois P20 network, uh, while we have not updated numbers on the website, we are now uh, well over 270 school districts, community colleges, universities, state agencies, and other organizations uh, that are part of the network with over a million students across the state uh, that are represented by the work of the organizations that these partners do. And so we're, we're really excited to be able to share information with everybody today to just help get the word out because you still have the opportunity um, over the course of the next eight days to dig into what we're gonna talk about today and provide your feedback. And as a matter of fact, we know that the state agencies are very, very interested in your feedback. So everything we're going to share here today is a draft document with the exception of the original PACE framework that's been out for a number of years now um, and will be replaced by some newer version of the PACE framework. So our goal for today is to give you some information and then turn you loose to provide feedback over the next eight days between now and March 21st. And we've got the links in here for the feedback form to be able to do that moving forward. And so uh, I'm gonna drop the link to the slides into the chat one more time here, and um, then we're gonna dive in. I do wanna let you know one last thing, and that is I do come from a background as a teacher, a principal, and a district level administrator prior to my work at NIU. And I think important for today, I've worked in two elementary school districts and one high school district. And I've never worked in a unit district. And so for those of you that are in a high school district or an elementary district, or for like our EFE directors or people from regional offices of education, if you are in a region with elementary districts and high school districts, this is a topic that's, that's really critical to, um, to do some of that work together across districts in order to meet it's the intent and the purpose of this. And so that is, um, that is, is really, really, um, really important for today's context. So this is a picture of my dog. This is Trini. Um, I, I have only had a dog um, for three years, for just under three years. Prior to that, I never in my life had a dog. And here I sit uh, with dogs with me for this webinar. That's kind of a first for me. Um, and we're playing ball while we, while we engage in the webinar. And uh, we're in this vet lab. And so I, I, this is so exciting because again, would I have been a vet if I had grown up with dogs? Yeah, I don't know. Would I have been a vet if my school district offered this when I was in high school? Eh, I don't know. But what we want to know, what we want to do here, and this is the central idea of the PACE framework, is we want students to know what their options are. And for most students, um, for most of us as teachers, knowing what the options are, that alone is very, very hard in a world where careers are constantly changing and evolving and new careers grow out of nowhere and old careers disappear out of nowhere. I mean, I like to give the example that um, I went to school in, in the early to mid 90s, I went to college at that time and the place I was going to college was literally uh, the place that was growing the World Wide Web. And no one imagined that within a year of me graduating, there would be tens of thousands of people around the world 
making money as a website developer. That was not a career that was in, in wide discussion, even at the institution that was at the center of that work. And so that's really, really important for us to keep in mind. And that's where the PACE framework comes in, frankly, not only for our students and their families, but for all of us. Obviously, we want our students to have opportunities to explore their interests as they learn about this range of careers and to really understand these, these workforce dynamics. How much money will I make doing that? How much money will I spend to get to that place and be able to make decisions informed by that? So this is what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna give you a little bit of history as well as some policy updates, talk about the PACE framework in its current form, which is its original form, and then really the, the meat of what we wanna highlight, the updated high school PACE framework, the new middle school PACE framework, and then wrapping up with the opportunities for public comments. So with that said, um, this all comes officially from the Post-Secondary and Workforce Readiness Act, which was passed into law uh, in 2016. It was unanimously approved through the General Assembly by a, a democratically controlled General Assembly, and it was signed into law by a Republican governor, Governor Rauner. And so I think that's important in the context of is that this was truly bipartisan in its origins and, and in its scope and in what it intends to do for our students, for uh, school districts and community colleges, and frankly, uh, for the workforce as well and, and for business and community organizations. So these are the four main components of the Post-Secondary Workforce Readiness Act. The PACE framework, which is the one we're gonna talk about today, and then competency-based education, transitional math and transitional English, English, excuse me, and the college and career pathway endorsements. So while we're not gonna go deep into other though, into, into all four of those and into the other three today, those are things you are certainly, uh, that we offer opportunities to learn about throughout the year. And um, we're happy to direct you to that information as well as the ISBE CTE webpage, which is isbe.net slash CTE. And if you've joined in the last little bit, I did just drop the link to the slides into the chat once again. So you've got access to that because there are some links in here um, throughout. So this past spring at the end of May, Governor Pritzker signed an amendment into law for the PWR Act. And this amendment is, is why we're here today. Uh, so this is exceedingly important. So there were two of the four areas that you saw in the PACE framework, the, or excuse me, in the PWR Act, um, two of them were the primary callouts in this amendment. One of those was the PACE framework, and the other one was the college and career pathway endorsements. And so it is really important for me to point out that at this time, Today, March 13th, as we stand here, um, the agencies are implementing or are in the rulemaking process. So there will be other opportunities down the line to have public comment on those rules. Um, and that's all uh, underway. But what we're going to talk about today is the work the agencies have done around the PACE framework. And this is really unique because it is multiple agencies, which is not typically the case. So here are the requirements of the new legislation for the PACE framework. Um, first of all, not listed on the slide, by July 1st, 2023, the agencies, and let me tell you who those agencies are. So most of you on this call are familiar with the Illinois State Board of Education um, that does most of the governance for early childhood and then governance for K-12 education in the state of Illinois. Then we have the Illinois Community College Board, the Illinois Board of Higher Education, and the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. And again, if you're in an elementary district or you work in an elementary school or middle school, you may not have a lot of awareness of the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, um, but very important in the financial aid space, they have also owned the PACE framework since its inception. So they lead professional development, they provide support and resources, and, and you'll start to see ISAC.org uh, as we move through this presentation. And so, but the responsibility for an initial draft of the updated PACE frameworks in line with this law for grades six through 12 is due to the state 
by July 1st, 2023. So the agency's got to work um, late last summer at the beginning of this, this school year, developing that new PACE framework. And so what we're gonna have in front of us today in this slide deck that's available out on the web is the result of that work. And it is now open for public comment uh, before it, it moves towards hopefully being official by that legislative deadline of July 1st, 2023. Then by July 1st, 2024, the Chicago Public School District 299 must adopt and start its implementation of a PACE framework for grades six through 12 and it has to be aligned to the state framework. So districts, and, and we'll get to this for all districts in the, in the next item here, but districts can adopt what the state has pr produced as it's written, or they can develop their own that is aligned with that. And we're gonna talk about the PACE framework as a curriculum document uh, momentarily or in a little bit here in this presentation. So it's really important that depending on your role, if we think about the, the occupying space of other state standards, the PACE framework really occupies that space for career and college readiness. That's how, that's how I would think of this from a curriculum and instruction perspective. So then by July 1st, 2025, all other districts in the state uh, that have students in grades six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 must have adopted their version. It could be the actual PACE framework or something they've developed um, internally, but that must be adopted and begin being implemented for the 25, 26 school year. All these frameworks, whatever each district must have a framework uh, posted on its website, by the relevant deadline date for that district. So for CPS, that's by July 1st, 2024. And for all other districts, you have to have that posted by July 1st, 2025. So with that said, let's take a look at the original PACE framework. And this and all of the PACE resources are available on the ISAC website. Um, these resources have continued to evolve over the years as they've worked with districts. They've made new resources, they've updated resources. One of the things I think that's really cool that was done a few years ago is, is they provided even more of a structure. They, they reordered some of the existing resources, added some new resources and almost put it into a walkthrough so that if I'm a principal, a curriculum director, a superintendent, who's ever responsible for implementing the PACE framework in a particular district, um, ISAC has tried to um, really walk districts through what they see as being the best practice for implementing that. So with that said, uh, the original PACE framework, one of the things I wanna call out from this text is that it is to provide guidance to students, families, and educators. So this is kind of unique in that the call out to families here, and that's that we're not just educating our sixth through 12th graders or previously our eighth through 12th graders on career and college readiness. We have a responsibility here to include students' families in that process. There's also an acknowledgement that for many of us as educators, um, unless we're deep into uh, the career and technical education or the college and career pathway endorsement space, we may not really have an awareness of what all the options are in front of our students. And so part of the idea here is that the PACE framework is designed to help those of us that may have less awareness with that along through that process. Um, it also, this is another really important statement about the purpose of the PACE framework. This acknowledges that high schools and uh, communities uh, at all, at, with, with all kinds of people involved and for learners of all ages have done career preparation, post-secondary preparation for many, many, many years, for decades, right? And so it's not to throw that baby out with the bathwater per se, but the idea of the PACE framework here is to really make this intentional and to have events feed into other events or activities feed into other activities and to ensure that these that this experience is available for all students and, and not just as something for students whose families read the newsletter and show up at that parent night, that they get that experience, but the other 80% of the students in the school do not get that experience. And so that's the, the really critical ideas here of the PACE framework is uh, we may be re continuing to do activities that we've successfully done for many, many years, 
but within a context, within a framework uh, that's really intentional. So one of the things we've talked about at the Illinois P20 network is this notion of, if we think about the MTSS model and tiered instruction and tier one being what all students are getting and the importance of having a really solid tier one and, and that curriculum and instruction is relevant, engaging for all students and some of the, the tier two and tier kind, three kinds of issues that we see, whether academic or behavioral or whatever, some of those will go away the stronger our tier one instruction is. Well, the PACE framework does provide essentially a curriculum, and, and we'll talk about that here, and a set of standards, if you will, for organizing tier one instruction around career and post-secondary readiness. And so I think that's a really important thing that we hope people take away from this, this initial look at these new frameworks, whether they do it well or not, that's where you have the opportunity to make decisions about that and offer feedback. But conceptually, I think that's a really, really important idea uh, for people to consider. So this is the original PACE framework. This is the current PACE framework still at the moment. You can see it goes from eighth grade to 12th grade. And there's a couple of really important things I wanna call out here to help you understand the composition, the structure of this PACE framework. First, in the lower left corner, uh, we have the, the three circle Venn diagram. There's some overlap between these things. They don't stand entirely on their own, but the red circle represents financial aid and literacy. The yellow circle represents career exploration and development. And then the green circle represents post-secondary education, exploration, preparation, selection. Um, I, will, I will share with everybody. One thing I have, have put into my feedback form is I, I'm not sure why the circles are red, yellow, and green. I actually have an idea in my head, but I don't know if that's the intended purpose. I would change the colors up of the circles because I don't think the stoplight analogy doesn't, doesn't work for me. Though again, I can make the argument that if we don't have the financial aid and financial literacy piece worked out, that stops us from having certain options. So maybe that was the idea. With that said, in each of these vertical bars by grade level, and 12th grade is a, is a little bit different, um, but there are two subsections. And that's highlighted here on the left side in the eighth grade. A student should be supported to, and a student should know. So this is really kind of getting at what should they be able to do and what should they know? So again, I, I hope that the connection to other kinds of curriculum and instruction standards um, starts to really uh, stand out with regards to that. Um, and then within each of the columns, you see that each of the, I'm going to refer to them as, as standards because they really, that's, that's the idea here from a curriculum and instruction framework. They are color coded with a circle, the, the bullet is not just a bullet point, it is a color code and it is yellow, green, or red. And I'm, I'm choosing those words very intentionally. You'll see why when we move to the updated high school framework. So the, if it's yellow, that means that represents a career exploration activity, uh, career development activity. If it's red, that means it's a financial aid and literacy activity. If it's green, that means it's a post-secondary uh, education, exploration, um, preparation, selection activity. And one of the things you'll notice as you move from left to right, all three of the colors appear at each grade level. So again, a curriculum and instruction connection I would make that I think would be particularly helpful for people working at the middle school and high school level is we know our math standards at one time, many years ago, algebra was something that you started in seventh, eighth, or ninth grade. And now we know that we are doing essentially pre-algebra activities since we're touching on each of the, the strands of our math curriculum at each grade level, we're doing them with our youngest learners. And in some ways always were, right? Two plus blank equals four, what goes in the blank? I, I mean, I did that in first grade many, many decades ago, but at the time it wasn't being framed as, hey, that's pre-algebra, that's algebra, that's really what we're looking at there. This works the same way as that idea in the math curriculum, that we are touching on all of these throughout uh, the years, the grade levels as students 
uh, grow grow up and move through uh, through through their school experiences. I will point out that there are far more red dots in 12th grade than in any of the other grade level because that's really where now boom I'm I'm filling out my FAFSA for the first time uh, in the fall of 12th grade, for example. And, and the realities, those financial realities are becoming real and there are actual tasks that students need to do in order to have those options available to them for their first year post-secondary. So this is the structure, this is the existing PACE framework as it stands today. Um, want to point out again on the ISAC website, there are lots of resources there. We are not diving deep into those resources today because we're sure that many, many of these resources, let me say this first, many of these resources absolutely applicable regardless of what the ultimate PACE frameworks look like on July 1st of this year as districts dive into this. But I also want to point out that this notion of of customized local examples, that's not new. As a matter of fact, there are districts in the state that have had PACE frameworks that have gone down to sixth grade, that have even gone down to the intermediate grades in elementary school prior to now. And you can see those examples on the ISAC website. So that is linked here in this slide in the slide deck. And again, you, you don't have to write your own PACE framework. You don't have to modify the state PACE framework but you also can do this so long as, as it is aligned with the new PACE frameworks uh, when those are available. So just food for thought. And again, we have districts literally across the state who prior to now have had their own custom PACE frameworks previously. So I wanna point out that everything for the rest of this, the, the key links are not only in the slide deck, they are on the ISBE website and they've been there for a couple of weeks now. They've been in the weekly newsletter from the state superintendent's weekly newsletter uh, that is now sent out by, by Dr. Sanders every week, um, typically on Tuesday. And so there, this is found on the um, college and career readiness page. That link is here in the slide deck. And, um, and there are links here to the new middle school framework that I'll show you momentarily, the high school framework that we'll look at next. There's a document that has been created that shows what the changes are from the existing framework to the new framework. Uh, so a summary document, we'll, we'll see a, a screenshot of that in the slide deck. Um, and then the feedback form that we'll talk about at the end. So all of that is also available. It's been available, it's been published um, and it's there and you can, you can go to that. You can send that link to others. And you can send this slide deck to others um, as you wanna talk about this further. So first, let's look at the updated high school PACE framework. So what we're not going to do right now is we're not going to dive into all of the details. And again, there is a summary sheet. Um, I did point out previously that um, each of the bullet points listed here, or the standards, has a colored, a colored circle next to it, the yellow, the green, or the red. Um, and I want to call out that like one of the changes, and this is just one minor change, but there is this idea by the end of 11th grade, you'll see it right in the middle vertically of that column that all students will complete a post-secondary plan workshop um, by the end of 11th grade. That's something they'll do. That's in the students should be supported to section. And that plan, as you can tell, just from the colored dots um, has all three, the red, uh, the yellow and the green dots next to it. And so that is an example of the evolution. There are content differences in here as well. And those differences are all outlined here and they're outlined by grade level. So this I think is particularly helpful for districts that have experience implementing the PACE framework. Now, if your district is new to the PACE framework, um, then frankly, I would spend less time with this document and, and more time just pulling apart this document, right? I mean, there's a lot in this. And so what we're not gonna do right now is do activities that unpack this. Um, we led a, an administrator academy um, just a couple of weeks ago on March 2nd, where we did do unpacking of the PACE framework. Um, and we will, we will offer that again coming up in the future. And certainly we will be unpacking the new PACE frameworks through that. And while it's an administrator academy, that is open to anyone. It's a great 
uh, half day online workshop for counselors to attend, um, teachers, teacher leaders, as well as administrators. And um, those that aren't administrators or administrators who don't need administrator academy credit absolutely get professional development hours for that. So, so this, what we're not going to do right now is the unpacking, but you may want to do that. And again, particularly if you're a district that has experience with the existing PACE framework or your own version of it, then this document is going to be what you're going to want to really explore. And we have changes in wording. Um, we have items that have been moved from one grade level to the next. We have items that have been deleted. Um, one of the things that I will call out is that um, I think things in the newer version, one of my takeaways is there's some more specificity. Um, and that's based on feedback, that's based on um, all the work that's happened in schools, the work that ISAC has done directly with schools, uh, what ISB certainly has seen and the results of this work that ICCB and IBHG and their institutions have seen. So really, again, this is a very handy, useful document for districts that have more experience with this. Now, the middle school framework is entirely new. So eighth grade is not new. Eighth grade was part of the existing framework, but the new legislation requires this to be sixth through 12th grade. And so, so that is, is very important here. So on the right side of, of this is the middle school framework. And on the right side of this, we have what was the left side or is the left side, excuse me, of the, um, of the high school paced framework. So there's that effort to draw a very clear connection. Then the first three columns are essentially the middle school framework. Now, on the right side of this middle school framework, you see the same red, yellow, and green circles with financial aid and literacy, career development, career exploration and development, excuse me, and post-secondary education, exploration, preparation, and selection. Now, on the middle school framework, we have three different circles. Um, and I will say, as a, a middle level educator, both as a teacher and a principal, these are certainly very, very important um, concepts at, at the middle level with young adolescents. And so these are self advocacy, identity, and planning. And so, one of the questions that we've asked people to think about and then offer feedback on is how well do these align and how do they align? And I think the, the more that practicing educators, particularly middle school and high school folks can talk about that alignment together and then offer feedback up in these, in these next eight days, um, the better off ultimately this tool will be. Then what you can see here in this tool is we have those same, um, in sixth grade, same idea of the two areas. It's a student should be exposed to and then a student should be supported to. And so then in seventh grade, it's just a student should be supported to. And then eighth grade, it gets a little complicated here because we have both the middle school framework eighth grade as well as the high school framework eighth grade. And it's the idea here is a student should be supported to so that then they can do these things in the eighth grade column from the high school framework and know these things from that column. And so it's a very similar idea. It's a little bit different. Um, and the, the activities are color coded or excuse me, the standards, if you will, or the competencies are color coded by identity planning and self-advocacy. And again, one of the things that you see here is um, all three of those, those areas, self-advocacy, identity, and planning, exist in sixth grade, in seventh grade, and in eighth grade. Um, and so they're, they're also chunked nicely uh, within each of the sections of each of the grade level uh, columns to, to help organize work around that. So at this point, again, we're not here today to, to unpack the standards largely, but this is an opportunity if people have questions, if there's strengths that you see that you want to share out with the group, if there's areas for improvement that you see that you want to share out with the group, um, you're, you're welcome to do that either in the chat um, 
or in um, or in the or or we can unmute. Um, and so I, I'm trying to scroll through here. Um, one question that came in to me directly is about whether or not these were crosswalked with uh, the ASCA or the Illinois SEL standards. And so um, I, I intentionally, and this is partially why we're doing this, I can't speak to some of the process that's happened. What I can say, and I, I don't wanna give away the like big reveal in our, in our administrator academy, I've done the work on the back end too to verify that, uh, that I still feel this way about the new PACE framework. But one of the things that, um, that exists with multiple PWR Act components, um, most, most explicitly actually the cross-sector essential employability competencies, which map to the SEL standards literally perfectly. Um, and so that's really cool for districts to think about what language do we want to use, or do we want to use different language with our elementary school students than with our high school students, but make sure they understand, again, particularly in fifth through 10th grade or fourth through 10th grade, that there's a thread in that language that's, that's explicitly going after the same concepts in their development. Um, and so I can't speak to that question, but that is a, a great one. Um, call out in the in the chat from Dr. Lance. The identity cluster is interesting to see, and uh, yeah, I mean identity, right? Um, I mean I certainly self-identify with my career, which uh, maybe maybe too much, but the uh, there's so much more to that, and to what degree does uh, to what degree is the identity and career piece a chicken and egg piece too, right? Especially for adolescents to think about. Um, as they consider who they are um, in in middle school and high school years, and and sometimes unfortunately consider things that they think they can't do because of who they think they are. Um, that's obviously something we want to eliminate altogether, and and we want to uh, support students' positive identity growth. Um, the can you detail the identity cluster requirements? So that's a great question. I, I'm going to ask you to. I guess, uh, oh, do you want me to just go through and call some of those out maybe is what you're, by the requirements, the standards, and if I'm getting that wrong and I'm going the wrong way here. So in I'm just, identity- Sorry, yeah, I'm just ahead. wondering if um, those identity, so right now we have to like keep track of um, the career pathway, for example, uh, which students have chosen career pathway. Uh, we have to keep track of things like for the college and career readiness initiative, you know, th there's several things, GPA, um, work experience, so on and so forth. Is that something that would be required? Uh, Great similarly? question. Yeah. So no, this does not add to the college and career readiness indicator uh, data requirements. So that is a great question. What it should do though, is it should make that, um, that ninth grade, um, you know, career, uh, the career pathway uh, identification for individual students. It should it should make that a, an easier to accomplish, more robust process after you if you've implemented the pace framework from sixth grade through twelfth grade, or again, particularly thinking about high school districts and elementary districts. And again, as a high school district, uh, if I've got students coming to me now where they've been working through this, I'm not starting from from scratch with that in ninth grade and still trying to hit that CCRI indicator. Um, and so, but there are, this is not at the moment, as far as I know, going to add any elements to our CCRI data collection. Um, at, at the moment, we want to make sure we're, we, there's an acknowledgement at the state level. And again, it wasn't ISBE that created the, you know, the idea behind the CCRIs um, necessarily, on, it's certainly on their own. I mean, it's legislative and it's part of the plan um, for, for the feds, for our our ESSA plan, um, but we we know there's a, that's a challenging, there are challenging components to that data collection. Some are not so challenging, students grades, what their test scores are, but other like multiple consecutive summers of employment, like that is a much more challenging thing that schools have traditionally not collected. So this does not add to that. That's a great question. Um, Emily's got her hand up. Emily, I'm gonna ask you to hang on one second there. Um, so, 
can you phase in year by year the plan, overall plan, so by eighth grade students will have flowed through the process? Um, so the ultimately, Charles, I can't ultimately answer this question. This is a great question that you've asked. So the idea being, could we start in sixth grade and, and ninth grade in the 25-26 school year? And then as that class moves through, they're getting bigger and bigger experiences. Um, from a school improvement, a school change perspective, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, with some of the language in the slides is, is direct from the law. Um, you've also got access directly to the law. And as we get more information, we'll certainly share that out. Um, but that's not one I can fully answer right now. Emily? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of respond a little bit to the data collection question. You know, so PACE has never been something that the like implementation of PACE has not been about tracking each and every one of these components, but rather as a kind of tool for coordinating, communicating, and offering a holistic suite of supports and information and experiences to students, right? All about preparing them for college, career, and life, right? Um, and so I dropped a link in the chat. Years ago, we did a crosswalk of the PACE framework with the CCRI and with the College and Career Pathway endorsement, mm -hmm. just to kind of show how all these pieces are aligned, right? So if a student were supported to complete all of the components of PACE in their district, they would probably meet the qualifications for a College and Career Pathway endorsement, right? So they're all kind of related. And so that might be a helpful resource, you know, even though you don't have to report out each of these component parts in PACE, the legislation just contemplates that districts would just commence implementation of the framework, right? It's not, um, you know, like Jason noted, there's rulemaking that'll have to kind of come out of that. But essentially, you're just kind of indicating to ISBE that you're going forth and implementing, right? And so um, it's not about the data collection for the individual PACE components in the same way that the College and Career Readiness Indicator or, um, you know, applying to be eligible to offer a College and Career Pathway endorsement involves. Thanks, Emily. Absolutely. And um, I appreciate Emily dropping in the crosswalk document there. And again, just for, for those of you people coming from some very different perspectives, it's a different crosswalk than, than the SEL standards, for example. Um, again, that's something we specifically look at in, in, multiple, um, in multiple workshops that we've conducted this year. And it's something we can continue to pull apart and unpack moving forward. Other comments? questions that you want to share at this point that you think might help others wrap their heads around this, because I'm anticipating that for many of you here today, you're either going to be the one for your district who then turns and leaves some feedback for the agencies, or you're going to turn and engage a group at some point this week in your district. Um, could be a curriculum team, could be principals, could be counselors, could be all kinds of people in, in sharing a little bit about this as a almost like a train the trainer, a leader of leaders model, and then sharing some feedback from that group um, with the agencies through the form. And, and either or both of those is great. The critical thing, again, is the agencies are absolutely looking for feedback at this point here, uh, while this is still new and in draft format. So any other comments or questions? Okay, so the public comment, um, it's, this is very simple. If you're like, oh, I've never done public comment before. Have you filled out a Google form before? Probably, most school districts, that's pretty common. Um, so this is that simple. Um, the comment period is open through next Tuesday. So we've got a little over a week and that's why we picked today. We wanted to give ourselves enough time to get the word out about sharing this information out and then also still allow districts uh, to have enough time and, and, and to offer their feedback. And in some cases, maybe to talk with other districts, um, for example, a high school district to engage their elementary districts and say, what do we think about this? And then still offer some feedback. So a couple of things I wanna call out here. First of all, oh, one of the things I've heard specifically from multiple people uh, at multiple agencies is they want to know that the tool will be useful to teachers in practice, counselors in practice, other uh, educators at the building level to do something with students and families with. 
And so if, if the tool in its current form, either the language, the wording, the structure, if you have ideas that could make it more useful for teachers, counselors, principals, other educators involved in this work, that is very much feedback that the agencies want. And then like any kind of public comment, if you think something's missing, certainly please offer that. If you think something's confusing, please offer that. And if you have an alternative wording, that's always always wonderful. Um, and if if you think if you think there's something great, you just want to call that out. Like we never would have thought of that, but wow, we see how relevant that would be for our students and families. Call that out. Um, people who work in in these roles at the state agencies um, hear a lot of our concerns from the field, and and they don't always hear a lot of our. Uh, gratitude from, from the field. So it is a, an opportunity to shout something out that you think is really great there. Um, so this is, it is a simple form. It is a Microsoft form form. Um, and you fill this out. It is linked here. We will drop the link into the chat as well. I'm gonna do that um, right now. And you can um, fill this out between now and March 21st, but Again, don't, don't, please don't put this off too long where you're like, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, and then it doesn't get done. Um, it's really important that the agencies get as much feedback as possible on how to make this as useful for students. And again, I want to stress the agencies are, are asking for that. They are seeking this out. And so um, thank you all for being here to learn about this and then be able to offer that. And so we've got some links at the end of the slide deck to subscribe to our newsletter and connect with us. But that is what we have here around this. And again, we can certainly stay on and answer other questions to the degree we have answers, or you can kick around ideas about this that you may have. And um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope everybody has a, has a great week this week.